All right. So CAD CAM inlays. Now let's start with inlays. So what do we know about the difference between an inlay and an onlay? Oh boy. <laughs> okay, so not nothing with direct indirect yet, but inlay versus onlay. Yes, Jaden. Inlay does not involve the cusp, but onlay involves the cusp. Right. So onlay, you're covering thing I guess on top of the cusp, and then inlay is sort of in between, right? So we'll start with inlay, which if you kind of look at it, it's kind of like just a MOD prep or a class two preparation, right? where you have a large um, um, restoration that instead of using composite, you rather use a uh, material that's all kind of polymerized or cured in one whole unit. Because if you look at our direct composite, what do we have to do when we fill an MOD, let's say with composite? You got to layer it, right? And why do we have to do that incrementally? What's the reason behind that? Polymerization shrinkage of the composite. So based on our operative class, what's the recommended increment that we build this up in? About two millimeters, right, max, okay? So we're going to layer or add on two millimeter increments of this direct composite. So the advantage of that is you can do it chair side, right, and it costs a little less. Uh, and it's simpler, and then if something kind of goes wrong, you can go back and repair it, okay? What's the disadvantage of it? Well, it's a little bit more technique sensitive, right? You got to jam this little wedge in. You got the little sectional matrix. You got to put the little band on, right? Do you guys still use the garrison thing, right? And that garrison thing just like pops off, and you're like, oh, I got to get it back on. And then you have a big ditch in there because you like you wedge it in properly, right? So until you get good at it, it can be a nightmare, right? So that's sort of the challenges of that. Um, and then the material doesn't come to a as full of polymerization as maybe your other materials, okay? So what if you, instead of kind of incrementally kind of adding to it, you just had, let's say, a whole block of composite that's already polymerized together and it's shaped in the exact kind of cavity or the preparation that you had prepared. So that's what we do with this indirect composite. So really the indirect technique is making an impression of that contour, pouring it up, and then in the lab, making this composite block that would fit back into the mouth, okay? So the advantage of that is you can use different type of materials that come to a more kind of full polymerization. It's a little bit stronger, okay? And then you, you have better control of the contours because you can take your time in the lab to kind of design it exactly as you want as opposed to your direct where, you know, you got an hour blocked out from in your office or in this school you have three and a half hours and you're sitting there and trying to kind of contour it exactly how you want it. Okay, um, so that's the indirect composite. So that composite, we would say, is stronger um, than the direct composite. Okay, if we go another step up, well, what if instead of using a resin plus filler combination, which is a composite, we use some sort of glass ceramic? So the glass ceramic has better wear properties. It's stronger, and it has the same advantages. You do it indirectly, so you can do it either in the lab setting on the stone cast, or you would do it CAD CAM style, okay? We have full control of the contours. Uh, but the disadvantage is one cost, it costs a little bit more, okay? And it's harder to repair. You can't just add composite to that because it's ceramic, all right? Um, so these are the differing kind of uh, modalities of treatment that we have. And as you go through your clinic experience here, um, our clinic faculty will help you kind of distinguish and determine which of these methods are probably better for that certain clinical situation, okay? Because you're gonna have a variety of situations and we can't go through every single possibility that's out there. Um, but the idea is um, inlays, you're not, you don't need to cover the cusps yet because you have sufficient tooth structure um, that will prevent that cusp from breaking off, okay? At some point, you're gonna get to the point where you say, oh, this is getting real thin, I want to jump to an onlay, and we'll talk about that in a sec. All right, so just some basic inlay prep design um, features, and a lot of this is kind of a repeat from your gold uh, crown or gold inlay onlay class, but just wanted to reiterate. Um, part of it is you want to have a path of draw, right? So the first thing you got to visualize is where your cavo surface margin is, okay? Where the ceramic is going to meet up, up against 
the tooth. Then you look down and you see where all your floors are. Okay? And what you want to see is some distance, or another way to put it is you want to see the wall, your axial wall. Okay? So if you were to outline it, it would look something like this. So as long as you can see the axial wall in all directions, then you know you have a path of withdrawal. Okay, so that's conceptually what you are trying to visualize as you sight down this occlusal from this occlusal view. Okay, if one of your walls are undercut, guess what? You're not going to see sort of that grayed out region, and you know you have to lean your burr. Okay, so compared to your crown preps, when you guys form these little outlines, I need you guys to exaggerate that draw or that divergence a little bit more than you're accustomed to. Okay, so when it comes to prepping, these inlays are a lot more technically challenging than any crown prep or onlay that you can have because you have more of these walls to look at. Okay, so look at your boxes. You have boxes on both sides, right? You also have your central groove, your isthmus. Then you have your axial walls, you know, everywhere. So there's just more things to pay attention to, and you, you just need one little area to uh, that's undercut, and the whole thing will get hung up. Okay whereas some of the other preparations are a little bit more forgiving. Okay. Um, so look out for your path of draw. So that concept still holds true. All right. So path of withdrawal concept is critical when visualizing the preparation design for inlays and onlays. Okay. The other thing you want to do too is compared to your gold crown or your gold onlays inlays, remember gold you just have to wax up and then cast to. So any little corner, you can get the metal to cast into that sharp area. Okay? When, it, when you talk about a CAD CAM fabricated prosthesis, what's the method in which that's manufactured? Well, here it's with two little burrs that grind it out, and that burr has a diameter of a millimeter. So you need to be able to visualize, is that burr going to sneak in to that little junction? Okay? So it's critical to have your preparation designs everywhere to be kind of smooth and flowing and no sharp turns, okay, and definitely no sharp angles. So you want to visualize the burr and make sure it can go, and you can see here, just kind of get into all those little areas. So one more time, okay. Um, so this principle I think we've talked about already in our crown prep design, right, where we had you round out any of the sharp points, okay. So same principle applies, but not only on the occlusal reduction, but looking down this view, you want you know, to visualize those smooth, flowing, rounded corners. Okay? Um, so something important for you guys to start to develop an eye for and know when is it too sharp and where do we have to round out. Okay? So same with your boxes. Uh, you definitely want those divergent, right? So you've got a path to draw. So from this view, I know you can't just extract the teeth and look from there, but um, that's sort of the image that you want in your head. Is my box kind of flared out like that? Right? That's going to allow for that prosthesis to just drop in. And then at your box area, so this is just talking about undercuts. So an undercut exists on the walls that are exposed. So this type of error will need to be corrected before the restoration is milled. Otherwise, it will not seat. Okay. So the Cerex software will mill restoration. OK, so the restoration, if you have an undercut at this external surface, it's actually going to mill that um, to where it should exactly how you designed it, OK? Meaning that if you have an undercut, you're not going to be able to seat that prosthesis down because the actual um, inlay is going to be wider than you have space for. It won't drop down, OK? This is for the external surface of the area. So anywhere that you've drawn your margin that's going to be kind of covering the outside or come in contact with the outside of your tooth. Okay? This is contrasted by something that is undercut on the internal surface. So if you look at the picture on the right, we actually have sliced through that inlay prep and we're looking at that isthmus right there. And you can see how the software has virtually blocked out the undercut there. right? So the software is able to recognize and undercut on the internal surface of that prep, and it'll virtually block it out, and then you can seed it all the way down. Okay? 
It doesn't do that for the external surface, because if you blocked it out, what are you going to have? An open margin, right? In this situation, on an internal wall, are you going to have an open margin here? No, because remember, this is a cross-section of that isthmus. So where is your margin in this situation? It's right here, right? As if you're looking straight down. So your margin here is closed. You're just going to have more space for cement there, OK? Probably lost a few of you guys, but we'll revisit this before your exam. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is, again, rounded corners. Round these out as much as you can, OK? So your exit angle, so this is different than your gold preparation in the sense that, remember, we're dealing with ceramic now versus gold. So remember, gold is really strong even at a thin area. Whereas ceramic, you rather have a bulk of ceramic at these exit angles. So I'll show you this little picture. And the purpose to show you this is that you see how this area is beveled, where this has sort of a butt joint, OK? So we prefer a boxed exit angle versus something that is sharp, OK? So the idea is that you want something that is more to a butt joint. So when you go prep your inlay onlay, don't be afraid. You almost need to extend these out wider than you think, because you definitely need separation between the teeth here. So you need at least that um, tip of that explorer to pass through here. So don't be afraid to widen out these boxes here to get to this boxed exit angle. All right? Any questions about your inlays? So let's quickly cover, um, talk about onlays and the idea is that we want to have some sort of cuspal coverage. Okay? So there's many different designs for these things, but let's go over the indications here. Right? So what you want to do, or the it, an onlay should be considered, um, uh, let's do this part. So for the replacement of an MOD amalgam, when sufficient tooth structure remains for retention and resistance form. Um, so this is just saying you still have, so this is from your traditional uh, inlay onlay kind of textbook, OK? Um, we're going to sort of cross out this retention resistance form criteria because, well, in the sense that if you can now do something that is all ceramic and bond to the tooth to gain our retention resistance form, okay? So we'll have a few slides on that principle and sort of these non-retentive prep designs. So there's been a shift in sort of the way we think about these onlay preps because of newer technology and newer materials. So obviously, if you're using the traditional method in gold, you've got to have enough walls for that onlay to stay on. Um, so we know that um, because these restorations rely on uh, intracoronal retention, inlays and onlays are contraindicated unless there is sufficient bulk to provide resistance retention form. So again, an old principle. Um, so they talk about MOD inlays may increase the risk of cusp fracture. So when you run into that situation where you run the risk of a cusp fracture, then you want to switch to an onlay to cover it. Okay? So extensive onlays required when caries or existing restoration extend beyond the facial lingual line angles um, and are contraindicated unless pins are used to supplement retention resistance form. Again, an older um, kind of thought, right? So we have certain advantages and disadvantages of uh, onlays versus full coverage. I'll let you guys read through those yourselves. Um, so the question is, well, how do things change when switching from a gold to CAD CAM ceramic? So this is really the part I want to emphasize, is the idea of you, you have these non-retentive preparations, right? So when you switch to an all ceramic system, remember we can adhesively bond or connect uh, the ceramic to the tooth. So it almost acts like super glue, right? So it just glues it on. So the important part here is you've got to analyze how much enamel that you have left, okay? So if you look at the preparations at the top, you would realize, well, there's not a lot of walls that prevent this restoration from just rotating off, right? If you were just to conventionally loot this together with a looting agent, well, the thing's just going to roll right off. There's no opposing walls to prevent that movement. But if you look more closely, you can see there's a band of enamel that covers circumferentially around the tooth. And what do we know about enamel bonding versus dentin bonding? It's a lot stronger, 
Okay, so when you look at these non-retentive preps and bonding a all ceramic material, you want to look at the amount of enamel kind of left over to bond to, because that's going to be the part that's really going to hold your restoration onto the tooth. Okay, you're not looking at the height of the wall, the actual wall, things like that. Okay, you're not relying on that. So here's another um, picture. And these are better examples of the width of enamel that you ideally have. So if you look at the two premolar preps, what do you notice about the width of enamel there? It's huge, right? So as you slice, so pretend you take some slices, cross sections of these teeth, right? As you move closer to the gingiva, does your enamel band get bigger or smaller? Smaller, okay? So actually, instead of prepping down and getting axial wall height, you're okay having a conservative prep by not reducing as much structure, because the higher up you are, right, the higher up your margin is, the wider that band of enamel is, okay? So it's actually to your advantage to not drop your margin, let's say, to the gingiva, if you can, okay? So if you have the choice um, here, would you say leave that preparation as is, or do I want to drop and kind of put a margin Right, your like traditional shoulder margin onto that tooth. Well, when you drop and put that shoulder margin and drop it down to the gingiva, sure you're getting more axial wall height, but you're sacrificing a lot of that enamel to bond to. Okay, so that's sort of the shift in dentistry that we're seeing is that we're transitioning more to this um, conservative type preparation and leaving more tooth structure intact because the technology and materials available to us allow for us to still have a prosthesis, a restoration that adheres to the tooth, but at the same time we can conserve that tooth structure. And what do we see when we conserve tooth structure? The advantage of that is, one, obviously structural integrity, but two, you do less damage to the pulp, right? The more tooth structure you have remaining, the more of a buffer it is to the pulp, the, mis the less trauma you're exerting on it because you're grinding that tooth less. Okay, so um, anecdotally, I'd say that we're seeing less issues with needing root canals after a lot of these large preparations when we do something a little bit more conservative type preparation. We're not reducing as much tooth structure, right? So that's the principle. Non-retentive preparations, um, we're seeing a lot more of these nowadays because of the good bond that we have to the enamel, right? So here are some examples. Um, so you can see the top preparation, right? If you were to just use a resin-modified glass ionomer, so look at that top middle picture, right? How the hell is that thing going to stay on there if we did it conventionally? It wouldn't, right? There's almost, you know, just one wall on one side. That thing could easily just roll off um, towards the lingual. But since we're bonding those into the place, um, we get... Um, success even at, this is a picture at five years that they've documented, okay? All right, um, let's go over this. So inlay design is going to be an MOD, all right? Um, so that's tooth number 14. Uh, tooth number 30, there's no real like ideal prep for onlays because it's really, as the video showed, there's so many different scenarios with like which cusp is undermined or which is not. So we just kind of arbitrarily picked sort of one design. And what you're going to start off with is an MOD prep. Okay, so a traditional MOD. Make this pretty wide. So we said at least three millimeters deep and three millimeters wide. And then you're going to drop your box. And then we're just going to connect your box. Okay, so like they were saying in the video, sometimes, you know, this box here, is deeper than where your shoulder is here. Well, in that case, instead of kind of taking the shoulder all the way down and making it even, you can just transition it up. As long as it's sort of flowing, you can make it like a roller coaster, okay? So no sharp angles is sort of the idea. Uh, but just for the sake of our exercise, we had to give you something to shoot for. So essentially, it's an MOD prep, and then you're going to connect the two boxes uh, together just in a straight line. You want to have a millimeter and a half reduction. So these are the parameters um, that we've kind of set uh, for you, uh, just to have some goal to, to shoot for. The big key is any of these angles here, especially as you get to this box, 
keep this rounded. So just always think, can a burr a millimeter wide sneak into these areas? All right. Um, so we need you guys to kind of start thinking through and kind of critically analyzing your preparation and then ask yourself, is this going to mill? And of course, you have your diverging um, walls here to allow for a path of draw. Okay. Um, so what we're going to mill out of is this Serona Block C, and it's actually a feldspathic porcelain. So if we went back to that first uh, slide where we had, you know, the different materials, you can do it out of composite or some sort of ceramic. So this is going to be an indirect ceramic because we're going to do it outside of the mouth. And then you can see it's less, not as strong as something like Emax. So Emax is up here in terms of flexural strength. That's at 360 me megapascals, and Emax is lithium disilicate. Okay, so it's still a porcelain, it's just not as strong as our Emacs, but the advantage of this is that you don't have to fire it. Remember, Emacs is in the purple state, right? What do you, what do you have to do before you can uh, seed it? Well, to change it from purple to tooth colored, you've got to crystallize it. Um, with these blocks, it's not as strong, but you don't have to go through that crystallization process. It's already sintered um, into a block form. Right, so this is what it looks like, and then this is what we're going to use to mill. So we're only going to mill the onlay, so tooth number 14 onlay, okay, and then we're going to bond it into place with cement, and I'll go over um, some of the um, steps for that. Okay, so let's switch over. Let me give you a quick uh, demo, just a refresher of how to. Um, how to navigate through the software, right? So everybody, um, probably get out your manuals because it's not well um, written out. We have some updating to do with the steps for the manual. Um, and it's real important to know these steps because I don't have a video for you guys, right? So the thing you want to do is image your preparation, OK? So that's our prep. And the important thing is to be able to see your margins and then um, to really, so you want to kind of tilt it to the sides and make sure that everything is captured. You're also going to get your opposing arch, and then you're going to do a bite scan. And then the bite scan, you want to get it on the prep in one of the adjacent teeth. So adjacent teeth, you want a full kind of tooth uh, next to that prep. So this is a critical part, okay? And make sure when you have the type it on it's articulated, you're going to do it by hand, but you want to make sure that's stable, okay? And when you orient the camera, you got to think about how the patient's cheeks are in the way. So don't go from like the back of the head and scan that way. You got to come from the front as if their mouth is open. So you want to orient it that way. And all you need is one good picture for the bite scan, all right? You don't want to do uh, multiple ones here. Um, so be sure to write all this down because uh, we don't have a video for this. So one bite scan, and then you're going to move on to the next step. So we're going to click the arrows. And then from here, this is the important part. It doesn't automatically do this. So you go step two, make sure I hit trim area. So you should probably write that down. So this is what trim area does. And look real closely. What you want to do is tell the computer where your interproximal um, separation is. So you have this line, you're going to double click here, to start it, and then you're going to navigate this line so it splits through the margin and the adjacent tooth. So it's important when you um, uh, image that you don't have the neighboring tooth overlapping where that margin is. Okay? So you see how it cuts away that side? It's going to be important to do this because we're going to need to visualize. Uh, where our margin is, and to get the teeth out of the way, it's, it's going to be easier to marginate when the teeth are out of the way. So again, I'm going to go to this side and double click, and I'm going to try to split and not um, get the margin, okay? So if this happens where it cuts out the wrong side of the tooth, you just hit invert selected. And what you want to be left with is this um, tooth by itself, almost like you're trimming your die. So trim area, and then, of course, you want to draw margin. So this just makes it easier for you to draw your margin, because now you can see that all the teeth are out of the way. 
right? So you want to start with your margin, and then it has that default to the auto margin finder, okay? So I want you guys to do this um, as independently as you guys can, all right? Because we got to kind of move you guys up um, and start to do things a little bit more independently and put on your big boy pants because you guys are getting close to where you'll be seeing patients, all right? So uh, make sure you know what you're doing here. All right, so you're going to go through, kind of check your margins. So this is where a clearly sharp defined margin is going to be easy for you to delineate and kind of see exactly where you need to draw your line. If you find that you have any kind of um, blips or anything like that, you probably want to go back and then refine that margin and then re-image to get a better mill. All right? So like your cable surface, you obviously, you know, a nice, crisp, clean margin, right? So the next part is define insertion axis. So you see that how tapered my preparation is? You almost see no yellow on there. If you have a large undercut, you may see some yellow. When you image, when you go and take your first picture, it should include the preparation. And then you want to angle it so that you can see your path, or you can see all the actual walls, because this is going to be your path of insertion, all right? So if you see a lot of yellow at this step, you may need to go back and then over and taper the areas that you have your undercut, all right? And then we go to design. So it'll run through a design proposal. And then you guys have played around with the software a little bit. Um, but this is another chance to get better at it. So the idea is we want you, you know, obviously you're not going to remember every single step, um, but the idea is that you, we want you to be comfortable, one, just like moving the mouse and stuff. That's one. And then two is figuring out what all these um, kind of tools do, okay? Um, so if you wanted to look in approximately, the nice thing after you've trimmed the model is you can hit this trim model button. And then it'll hide all the neighboring teeth so that you can get to this interproximal region. Okay? So here you want to um, kind of um, smooth out or adjust the contact so that your contact is in the ideal interproximal position. So obviously our contact shouldn't span the whole uh, occlusal cervical dimension. right? You want to have a little bit of an embrasure space where there's a little um, space there. You want to concentrate that contact right there, okay? So you can spin it around and then do the same thing here so that you have your ideal contact area. And then you can check your occlusion and make sure you're not in um, hyper occlusion. Um, so you can turn on your contact. So there's all these differing um, buttons that you know you just kind of need to play around with to figure out um, where you're at. Um, so if you wanted to, let's turn on our tools again. If you want to increase the contact, you can take your uh, shape tool, and there's anatomical and circular, uh, but basically you can grab a whole section and then just kind of increase certain cusp areas. So this is our functional cusp. So if you wanted that in a little bit heavier occlusion, you can raise that up. Okay. So when you're done designing, then you go to the mill phase. So what I'm trying to look for is good interproximal contacts in the ideal locations, and then some occlusal contacts on your functional cusp. Right? So those are the two parameters I'll be looking for. Once you think you got that all good, then you go to your mill step. And this isn't connected to the mill right now, so we have an error. Um, but basically, it'll ask you to insert the block um, which will give you, um, and write this down, um, it's a CEREC, when you go select the block, CEREC block 14 is what we're going to be handing out to you. Okay, so make sure that is uh, connected. Um, and you'll insert that and screw that into the uh, milling unit just like you did with your Emacs. And then these take about 15, maybe less than 15 minutes for it to mill. All right? So the important things to remember is your um, trim model, and then play around with the tools. Uh, I want you to be pretty independent, um, kind of working through this 
Um, we'll have some people up the front if you need some help. Okay? So feldspathic porcelain, this is a ceric block. Let's talk about uh, how to bond uh, this in. Right? So somebody give me, how would you bond this feldspathic omelet onto the tooth? Give me your steps. Okay, first step. So you want to etch the prep, then what do you want to do? Alex? Ivo clean what? Okay, so you can Ivo clean. So we're jumping from, let's finish off with the tooth first. We'll start with the tooth. Okay, so once you've etched the tooth, so maybe we start with the crown first. Okay, so Ivo clean the, the crown. Okay. And what does that do? What's the purpose of that? Oh, okay. So we got to step back. So you want to hydrofluoric acid the, the crown, right? So what does that do? Etch the crown so it increases the surface area, right? Hydrofluoric acid etch. Number two, then, I will clean to remove the phospholipids because you've tried in the crown. Okay. And then what? Silane coupling agent. And what is that? And that's our monobond plus, right? How long do you scrub that on for? Or you scrub it on, how long do you let that sit for? 60 seconds, okay? So now the onlay is ready to be cemented, right? So now let's jump to the tooth. So you already said we're going to etch. How long are we going to etch for? Oh, come on, guys. This is operative stuff. 20 seconds, okay? Then what are we going to do? Bond, right? And then air thin, and then cure, right? And then you're going to load your cement onto the onlay. Or actually, in this case, you're not going to load the cement. In a crown, you'd load the inside of the crown. In this situation, because um, actually, in onlay, you can probably load. It's probably easier to load onto the tooth. So, inlay, you definitely want to load into the tooth. If your onlay has some sort of like you know, carry or it's got some cussable production you can put on the inside of that. Um, so um, load the cement and then you're going to seat it. Once you seat it into place, what do you want to do? Tack cure to get to that rubbery consistency. Take it off and then full cure and then you want to use your glycerin, right, and cure again because that polymerizes that oxygen inhibited layer. Okay. So a couple things we're going to do um, here during this process is, one, you're also you're going to bond this under rubber dam isolation. Okay. So we're going to get good at this because you're also going to do this for your um, post and core too, right? So always bond these under uh, rubber dam isolation. Um, so I want to see those when you're ready to bond. Okay. And then um, this is uncemented, but that's how an inlay would lurk, look, and I have an example of an onlay. Um, I'll have that on the screen. All right, a couple things to note, and then uh, sim clinic instructors, um, you guys missed this earlier, but the grading sheet for the inlay onlay is actually under operative two, so it's not in our fixed process. So tooth number 14 inlay, tooth number 30 is our um, onlay prep, and we're gonna reduce the buckle cuss. So those pictures were showing the buckle cuss. For tooth number 30, your onlay, I want you guys to prep pretty independently, okay? I mean, you don't get any feedback from us, okay? Because I want to see you guys work through the whole workflow and then um, figure out in your own mind, kind of imagine, oh, where do I need to round off, okay? Because we need you, again, putting on the big boy pants to start making some clinical decisions for yourself, and then go ahead and mark your margin and mill out your onlay, okay? And then you're gonna bring that onlay up to me, and I'm grading everybody's onlay, okay? So your inlay, you get you know, your row instructor to grade, um, but I wanna see all your onlays and just see your preparation, okay, without any help, and your milled processes just to see how well these things fit, okay? So a couple reasons, one, Again, it's for you to start making clinical decisions for yourself, okay? Part of the learning process is, you know, we got to be okay with failure. And then two, I just need more 
pictures for next year to show what not to do. So I know some of you do well, some of you will have some errors, but that's okay because um, then we'll have a little slide of what not to do, so next year's class will be better. Okay? So work independently, and then I get to see them all. I'm going to have a list uh, to check you guys um, off. Okay? And then you're going to bond um, these in. We're going to have a resin cement available. This is important, guys. Um, we're not going to have you go through all the steps with all the silane and the hydrophobic acid and all that because it's just expensive and we don't want to go through all the steps. But before you cement, okay, you have to go to your row instructor and then verbally lay out all the steps and why you're doing all those steps. Okay, So for row instructors, <coughs> everything we just laid out. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Next step, okay, because I need you to understand. I don't want you to just write it down and then read it off. I need you guys to think through each step and rehearse that, not only in your head, but also verbally to your instructor before you cement your onlay, okay? So we're not going to have all that for you to actually physically do, but in your mind you need to understand those principles and then know the sequence of steps like the back of your hand, okay? Any questions about that?